Um, now, I have what is for me a super special pleasure because it's been 40 years in the making, maybe more than 40. Um, and I just want to say one personal thing about Letty, which is that if there was ever a proof that she is in the Jewish tradition of justice, it is all my years of listening to her in editorial meetings describe situations of great conflict and describe all sides. No other person in our meetings could ever do that, and we were spellbound, spellbound. <laughs> she has played uh, such a role in my life and in the world. It's not possible to express. This is why they gave, this is, this is why they gave me something to read. Okay. 20 years ago, Letty Cotton Pogrebin helped the Jewish Women's Archive articulate its mission in the very beginning. Quote, for a people whose ethos, whose very identity is founded in remembering, she wrote in Deborah, Golda, and me, her wonderful book, we have forgotten too much about Jewish women. For a community that calls itself the people of the book, we have left too many pages blank. The Jewish educational establishment has left us ignorant of Jewish women's past, unquote. Letty is a woman of too many firsts to list, but for the Jewish Women's Archive, she was the first speaker at the first Jewish Women's Archive event before it was officially launched more than 50, 15 years ago. As a writer and as an activist, Letty has shaped the feminist agenda for a generation. Her nine books, those of us who have many fewer, <laughs> are very jealous of her nine books on, exa are, are on examples of troublemakers, female role models who inspire contemporary acts of boldness and vision. We are so proud, I am so proud, the Jewish Women's Archive is so proud to present our Making Trouble, Making History Award to the Letty Cotton Pogrebin. <laughs> we have to wait for my husband because he's Jewish and it takes a while for him to do technology. <laughs> Our house is the quintessential Jackie Mason house, where you walk in and the, the VCR is flashing 12. Because we don't know how to set the clock. <laughs> Sorry, love. <laughs> That's what happens when I get the podium, public humiliation. <laughs> um, thank you, Gloria, who has um, sweetened my life and uh, is a presence even when she's not here, even when she's in India, which she goes to, or she said some Indian reservation, which she goes to. Wherever she goes, I carry her with me. Uh, thank you, Jewish Women's Archive, for this precious honor. And congratulations to my sister honorees, Elizabeth and Rebecca. Thank you to all my friends from all the different groups that I have either started or co-founded or been part of, specifically my Rosh Chodesh group. Several members are here. <laughs> Yay. Um, my various Torah groups, my Palestinian Jewish dialogue group. Um, thank you to two friends of mine who've been very important to this day, Arlene Alda and Kathleen Paradis. I have felt your support really like a buttress. Thank you. And thank you to Gail Reamer, the great Gail Reamer, for thinking up JWA and leading it so lovingly and so gracefully. Kudos to JWA's board and staff, especially Barbara Dobkin and Prudence Steiner, who worked so hard to get me to say yes when I really wasn't supposed to do anything but finish a book. 
And thank you to its wonderful staff for fulfilling the organization's mission to rescue, chronicle, and transmit the history of American Jewish women. And special thanks to Susan Schlechter, also in my Torah group, but because it was her idea to book today's event in this great venue. I was thrilled when I heard we were going to be lunching together within sight of the Statue of Liberty. Not too clear, but we know she's there. Because I love her, even though she's not Jewish. <laughs> the statue was a gift from France to mark the centennial of American democracy. I love this iconic monument for its grace and beauty, of course, and for what it stands for, welcome, freedom, hope. But I particularly love it because it embodies the very concept of liberty as a woman. And it valorizes a poem, The New Colossus, written by a Jewish woman. I'm in pig heaven, except it's not kosher. <laughs> Besides being an acclaimed poet, Emma Lazarus was an activist for immigration and immigrant rights and against the trivialization of women's poetry. She protested the literary establishment's narrow definition of what subject matter was appropriate to women writers. When her mentor, Ralph Waldo Emerson, failed to include any of her work in his 1874 anthology, Parnassus, Lazarus fired off an angry letter. She did not take injustice lying down. She also claimed her Jewish identity with pride. She protest protested anti-Semitism am among Gentiles and complacency among Jews. She was a Zionist. 60 years before Israel was born, she favored the founding of a Jewish state in Palestine. Lazarus wrote the new Colossus to help raise money for the purchase of the statue's pedestal, an enhancement that wasn't included in the French gift. Gloria often says, fundraising is the world's second oldest profession. <laughs> <laughs> and Emma Lazarus did her part in 1883. Lady Liberty is one woman I want on a pedestal. You know what we say in the women's movement, who wants a pedestal? It's a very small space. <laughs> Just imagine how much of her grandeur would be lost if she only stood 151 feet high from base to torch, rather than more than 300 feet high with the addition of her majestic pedestal. Lazarus's poem contrasts the ancient Colossus of Rhodes, whom she calls a brazen giant, with Lady Liberty, the new Colossus, quote, a mighty woman with a torch, her name, mother of exiles, unquote. What gorgeous words, a mighty woman, a mother, a powerful combination. I also love the sculptural details of the mother of exile, her torch, lighting our way to a better future, tablet, inscribed with the date of the Declaration of Independence, July 4th, 1776, and the broken chains at her feet, symbolizing the end of oppression. Over time, as we all know, the statue has come to stand for the hope and promise of the immigrant experience. But from her very first day, she also stood for American women's struggle for freedom and equality. A group of suffragists who had four dollars between them managed to raise one hundred dollars so they could hire a freight steamer on October 28, 1886 and transport themselves to the unveiling of the statue to protest the fact that only two women were included among the 2,000 honored guests at the dedication ceremony. Who knew? What else is new? Today, in 2012, women are still overlooked and under, underrepresented on podiums, in delegations, at conferences and ceremonies. On July 15, 1915, another group of suffragists staged a demonstration at the foot of the statue demanding the right to vote. Today, in 2012, we have the vote, but not enough women use it. Let's hope this year millions more women will turn out at the ballot box 
to elect legislators who will advance women's autonomy and dignity rather than call us names for wanting to control our own sexuality and reproductive health. <laughs> On August 10th, 1970, to express support for ratification of the Equal Rights Amendment, a cadre of stealth feminists carried sections of a huge banner onto Liberty Island, pieced it together, and draped it across the statue's entire base. The banner said, women of the world unite. Twelve years later, the ERA failed, and ever since, the clock has been moving backwards on women's issues politically. Maybe it's time for women of the world to unite for some serious troublemaking. How about Occupy the Statue of Liberty? <laughs> we could do it in memory of the three holy troublemakers who died in the past year or so and whose lives JWA has chronicled. Debbie Friedman, <clears throat> the gifted singer-composer of Jewish liturgy and balladeer of Jewish healing. I know if she were alive, she would have been here. Esther Broner, the brilliant creator of innumerable feminist rituals, co-author of the Women's Haggadah, and inventor of the Women's Seder. I know if she were alive, she would have been here and Paula Hyman, who was mentioned earlier, a passionate advocate for women's history and professor of Jewish history at Yale. I'm not sure she would have come down from New Haven, but her spirit is with us. Finally, I love the Statue of Liberty because she reminds me of my mother. My mother emigrated from a little shtetl in Hungary called Pilipitz at age seven having sailed to America with her parents and siblings in steerage. She died when I was 15, but I remember her telling me that when her ship entered New York Harbor and she saw the lady with the light, she wept with joy. That day, she turned her back on the poverty and pogroms of the old world, never to return. Why would I want to go back there, she asked my father when he suggested a trip to Europe in the early 50s. I think she was afraid that if she ever left our shores, she wouldn't be allowed to return. My mother was deeply grateful to the United States for taking her in. She cherished her citizenship papers. She decorated our house for the 4th of July. She celebrated Thanksgiving as if she were descended from John Smith. But proud as she was to be an American, she often behaved like a guest in her own country. As a Jew and an immigrant, she never felt she quite belonged. As a woman and a wife, she never controlled her own destiny. She was raised to be a subservient Jewish helpmeet to a Jewish man. For the sake of Shalom Bayit, peace in the home, she downplayed her talents and intelligence and squelched her, hung, her anger and frustrations. She died in the 50s, the age of apathy. I doubt she would have believed it possible for women to rebel against the strictures of the feminine role and the stifling of women's voices in the way that mil millions of us have. I wish she'd lived to see the, us making trouble and making history. Someone once said all societies honor their live conformists and their dead troublemakers. Thank you, Jewish Women's Archive, for honoring Elizabeth, Rebecca, and me while we're still alive.